everyone. Thank you for logging into today's webinar. I'm Uma Medinadan, the Scientific Program Manager for the RDoC unit here at NIMH. And in today's webinar, we're going to address the topic of how to analyze RDoC data in your research. We are very happy to have Aristotle Voinescos, Lisa McTague, and Meredith Wallace here with us today for that purpose. So say hi, folks, to everyone. <laughs> hi. All right. So in terms of the order of things today, um, I'll first cover what RDoC is and give you a very brief overview of it. Then we'll have each of our panelists present briefly on their work, after which we'll have an integrative discussion uh, about their studies and how they illustrate ways to analyze and integrate data obtained using multiple methodologies. So let me start by sharing my slides here. So just in case we have folks who are listening in who are not familiar with RDoC, here's some sort of RDoC 101. And I've underlined keywords on the slide in red here and bolded them that you should pay attention to. So RDoC, our Research Domain Criteria, is an initiative that was begun by NIMH in 2009. It is a strategy or set of principles uh, for research in mental disorders. It is not intended for clinical use at the moment, just for research, and so that's why I've underlined those words there. And the core of RDoC is centered around the notion of constructs, that is to say concepts or theoretical entities that are relevant to mental disorders. These constructs are based on both biology and behavior. Our doc does not prioritize any one methodology above the other. And such constructs are also measured dimensionally. That is to say, they cover both the normal and abnormal range of the trait you're trying to get at. And keep in mind, the reason I've underlined the word measured is because um, I'm referring to the measurement of that construct. So in reality, your construct may have discontinuities at some latent or underlying level but you want to measure it dimensionally so that you get the maximum information on it possible so that you can use the information to determine where to draw those cut points or determine if something is truly categorical. Um, the next is that the presence of constructs inferred by using multiple units of analysis in RDoC parlance are methodologies to get at it. Again, we don't value any single methodology, biology, or behavioral self-report above the other. And finally, such constructs may help parse heterogeneity within or across a disorder. And the idea is that these constructs are getting at mechanisms that lead to symptoms or symptom sets within or across disorders. And the meaning of this will become a little bit more clear when you listen to our speakers present today. So just keep these sort of basic principles of RDoC in mind as our panelists go through presentation today. And some other things to note about RDoC are as follows. So many of you are likely familiar with our RDoC matrix, the grid-like structure on our website. Uh, the matrix is actually a tool for helping you implement the principles of RDoC in your research. It's a list of the major constructs and domains that are thought to be relevant to mental disorders and was derived from a series of workshops that were held between 2010 and 2012 where over 200 expert researchers convened here at NIMH to define and delineate those constructs. The constructs and domains in the matrix are not considered to be entirely independent of one another. They are distinct in their distinct dimensions, human behavior and functioning, but thought to function interdependently and affect each other. So for example, the RDoC domains of positive valence systems and negative valence systems um, do affect each other in cognition as well. So as we all know, emotion affects cognition but they're still distinct sort of, um, domains of behavior. And finally, the matrix is not set in stone. It is expected to evolve as research accumulates based on the constructs that we have defined here so far. And a very important key point to keep in mind is that RDoC is not the matrix. A lot of people sort of conflate the two. They think RDoC equals the matrix, which is not the case. RDoC, again, is a set of principles that I showed you on the previous slide. And the matrix is merely a way of implementing or operationalizing those principles. And lastly, this is a question we get often, which is what about development environment? And those do matter very much to RDoC. While they're not specified in the matrix as same level of detail as constructs and domains, this was done deliberately because we wanted to leave it up to investigators to decide how best to specify them in their work. So this picture summarizes what I just talked about in terms of how RDoC is a set of principles that aims to get at constructs or mechanisms which lead to heterogeneity within or across mental disorders by using multiple methodologies. So one question we often get is, well, how exactly do you do that? I mean, you say integrate data, but how do you integrate data from multiple methodologies? What statistical method or methods do you use? So I'm gonna go ahead and spoil the surprise ending of our webinar now for you. And the answer is that there is no single method we would advocate 
it all depends on the on your study and the question you ask as long as you follow the principles of RDoC that I talked about earlier. What we would like to do in the next hour is to show you why this is the case, why there is no single statistical method or analysis that can address all problems, and how to go about doing your study in that case. So during today's webinar, we'll have three researchers present data from their studies that are along the lines of RDoC, and they discuss how and they'll discuss how they approach the issue of data analysis in their work. So we're very happy to have Lisa, Aristotle, and Meredith here with us today. Aristotle will start us off by presenting his work on social processing deficits and psychosis spectrum disorders. He'll talk about integrating various types of data using a statistical method called partial least squares. Lisa will present next and will show some psychophysiological data on work she's done in relation to fear and anxiety. And her work focuses on a more theoretical approach to integrating data. And then finally, we'll have Meredith who will discuss some new clustering methods that she has been working on and we'll talk about why it is very important to pay attention to features such as skew in your data before you run some analysis. And in between each presenter, we'll also have a couple of minutes to focus on any questions that you might be interested in asking that specific their presentations. And as I mentioned, you can type these in at any point of time to us in the Q&A window. We'll also have a broad integrative discussion at the end in the last 15 minutes or so, where you can ask questions about sort of common themes amongst the research or questions that apply to any of them. Again, what we'd like you to pay attention to during each of our panelists' talk is how their work fits the RDOC principles and sort of how they approach the research questions they had in their studies. So let's get started now. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Um, Aristotle will be our first presenter. Um, Aristotle, it would be great if you could talk about your research program briefly and then um, start discussing your study. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm Aristotle Vanescus. I'm at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health uh, in Toronto, at the University of Toronto. Um, my research program largely uses <clears throat> brain imaging approaches to understand more about psychiatric disorders and also uh, uses brain imaging in the context of intervention studies. Um, but today I'll be talking about one specific study, which is a, a multi-center uh, brain imaging study uh, that uses um, the RDOC framework. So I guess I'll just get started. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. Is that look okay to everyone? Yep. Okay. Got the thumbs up from Uma. All right. So I can get started. Right. So the um, uh, title of our grant application was um, Social Processes Initiative in Neurobiology of the Schizophrenias and acknowledging the fact that there are maybe many schizophrenias and also you know, really underscoring the point that there's a lot of heterogeneity in this disorder. And I think, as might have been mentioned already, uh, this is a study that is looking at schizophrenia spectrum disorders in healthy people. Um, it's not a study that looks at a number of different diagnostic categories other than those in the schizophrenia spectrum disorders. And that was in part because it was a starting point, but also because we felt there's a lot of heterogeneity already in um, the social cognitive uh, constructs that we're using within the social process domain to at least uh, get started and certainly we know there are other disorders with social cognitive impairment and others that may have less social cognitive impairment but the point was really to have a range of, of performance from great a significant amount of impairment to people who are, are very good at, at uh, performing social cognitive tasks um, so this is a three site a collaborative R01. So there's an R01 to uh, my center in Toronto, one to Zucker Hillside Hospital, and one to the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. So we're trying to do the exact same thing at each site and then combine all the data uh, at the end of the study for analyses. So we're collecting 60 healthy controls and 100 people with schizophrenia spectrum disorders at each site. Um, and just to note that the study just started actually, so <laughs> there isn't a whole lot of data to present to you, but I will get into a little bit of pilot data. Uh, but it, we just started up in, in late 2014, and so we're, we're not wrapping up till 2019. Um, and as I mentioned, there's, uh, it's a neuroimaging study, so we have a number of structural and functional neuroimaging acquisitions we're doing when people get into the scanner. Uh, detailed clinical and neurocognitive assessment, because we know that those things may actually be related to social cognitive performance, so we want to be able to disentangle the relationships between these variables, understand aspects of shared variance and unique variance. And we're also really uh, interested in how all this relates to social function or functional outcome in the real world, actually outside of a scanner, outside of a lab. And as Uma mentioned, we're using the partially squares multivariate approach. We think a multivariate approach is necessary to relate a lot of data that may be uh, collinear or that might um, have a lot of shared variance. 
so I'll just move to the second slide. So we just built a model when we were writing the grant of, you know, a set of hypotheses that we were testing. Um, we may or may not uh, disprove them. We'll see. But uh, basically, just to have some kind of conceptualization of what we were testing, we um, are hypothesizing that there are some circuits, including the frontal parietal circuit that might be on the right side of the brain that might be better known by some as the mirror neuron system or the simulation system that might be related to what we call lower level social cognitive processes. So these are basic emotion understanding and then a cortical midline circuit and some lateral parietal temporal regions that might be related to higher social cognitive processes that might be more related to understanding higher level intent and attitudes of others. We have a number of uh, tasks that we're doing in the scanner and number of tasks outside of the scanner, including some dynamic tasks where people watch videos and have to really get at what's going on in a more real world type setting. And then we're also relating that to functional outcome. So that's just the model that we're testing. Uh, we'll see. Um, so as I mentioned, there's going to be many imaging and many behavioral variables that we're dealing with. And that's, you know, a blessing and a curse at the same time. Um, so the partial least squares approach has a few advantages. It's not a perfect method, but it, I think it's, it's one that's fairly well suited to the design of the study. Um, basically, it pulls out latent variables from, if you think of two sets of data, if you kind of think of the left side and the right side, sort of the X's and the Y's maybe, to put it really simply, of all the imaging data on one side and all the behavioral data on the other side. And you really want to try and pull out what the latent variables are that relate these blocks of data. Um, so the pro of that is you really get to see all the you know, imaging variables that might be related to a number of behavioral variables at once, and there's going to be independent series of those types of relationships. Um, the con is that you know you may you're not going to get single brain region to single behavior relationships like you would in more univariate style analyses. But the nice thing is you can get measures of significance of these latent variables and also measures of reliability of the data. And I think that's really important in heterogeneous disorders because sometimes, especially in smaller end studies, your findings may be driven by a subset of individuals uh, who are sort of way off to the side in one direction or something along those lines. And, and that's sometimes hard to detect when, you know, when you're, when you're looking at your data yourself or, or writing up the paper. And as I mentioned already, it can, PLS can take into account dependent measures that are uh, highly correlated. We know, you know, the activity of uh, hundreds or thousands of brain voxels are going to be correlated all at once. So it's important to be able to take that into account. So just to talk about this a little bit more, it, it, without getting into any math, because I'm not a mathematician, but um, as I understand it, partially squares, of, basically it's a least squares decomposition of part of a covariance matrix. And so as I already mentioned, you're basically explaining the relationship between two or more blocks of data. Uh, and then you do statistical assessment through sampling algorithms, both through permutation testing and bootstrap estimation of standard error to determine a reliability of the latent variables uh, you've detected. Okay, so I'm just going to take you through um, sort of an example of uh, a task and some very preliminary results. Unfortunately, only in a small number of people because, as I mentioned, we're just early on into the study. And at the end, we're hoping to have a much larger number of people. And I'll try and get to how we might use that to our advantage. So one of the two functional tasks we're doing in the scanner is a very simple task known as the imitate observe task that was pioneered by Marco Iacoboni, um, and he's actually a consultant on our grant. He's at UCLA and has really pioneered some of this work in people with autism spectrum disorder, and I, you know, we think that's an interesting relationship with exploring down the road between schizophrenia spectrum and autism spectrum disorders. So this task is believed to activate the mirror system. Basically, someone goes into the scanner and there's two five and a half minute runs. They're either observing a number of uh, faces with different very prominent facial emotions, as you can see on the image down below, uh, and then in the second run, or it could be the first run because we counterbalance things, they're uh, imitating the faces. Um, and so the idea is through, uh, basically through mirror neuron theory, the idea is that when you imitate these faces, you're activating that circuit a little more intensively than you might be when you're simply observing the faces. So these are some of the early data we based our hypotheses on, uh, but also I think are useful as an illustration of where we were and where we want to get to. Um, so these are, this is Marco's seminal Nature Neuroscience paper in 2006, uh, where he uh, studied uh, younger uh, people with autism spectrum disorder and healthy controls. And in uh, image A, you can see um, basically what is uh, a map of the activation uh, in the brain uh, during the imitate task uh, in one of the groups. 
you know, in that paper, he also showed the same activation in another group and basically tried to contrast the difference. Uh, and you could get kind of a regional assessment of what region might activate differently than another. And then he followed that up uh, looking at some voxel behavior correlations. So he looked at some peak areas of activation, correlated them in a univariate fashion with some measures of social function uh, in people with autism. So I think that's the way functional MRI studies have gone for quite a while. And I, I think that this is critical early work in which we you know, base our hypotheses on. But what we'd like to do is take things a step further. Um, and so this is hopefully this isn't like a slide that shocks the system too much, but I'm going to take a minute or two to explain it because this is my second last slide and then I'll, I'll just conclude briefly. So uh, not much of a transition here because of time, but basically this is an example of one type of PLS and I'll take a minute or two to explain as I mentioned. So we were able to con construct different contrasts of fixation, neutral and emotional faces within the imitate condition and then within the observed condition. You can see those labels in, on the first panel. And then labeled on the bottom of the first panel are the different social cognitive tasks. So instead of simply correlating activation of a voxel with a single task, we're getting um, correlations of, of brain activation with a number of behavioral social cognitive tasks. So ER40 is the emotion recognition, RMET is reading the mind in the eyes, RAD is relationships across domains, and tasks at one, two, and three are aspects of test of the awareness of social inference. On the bottom panel, you can actually see parts of the brain that activate at different time points during uh, the task. Um, and uh, the red basically means there's a positive correlation with the bars that are going up in panel A, and the blue means there's a positive correlation with bars that are going down in panel A. And so you have inverse correlations, though, with blue blobs and bars that are going up and similarly with red blobs and bars that are going down. So what you can really see is what parts of the brain are positively correlated with performance on these tasks in specific conditions, both during imitate and observe, and what parts are uh, inversely correlated. Um, so rather than you know spending a lot of time explaining what these results mean, this is just an example. It's a, it's a very rich amount of data. It's just in 20 healthy controls just to kind of use as a proof of principle or proof of concept. You can really see here that you kind of can get out from here that some of the tasks are highly correlated and some brain regions are highly correlated with each other. We can really get the sense that things are looking quite different depending on whether someone's imitating an emotional face or a neutral face. And you can really see that, um, that the uh, extent of activation uh, correlation relationship, correlations with uh, the behavioral task is diminished in the observed condition compared to the imitate condition because on the y-axis you have the degree of correlation and that's kind of what we'd expect as well that you're going to have stronger correlations during imitation because you're activating that mirror neuron circuit more intensely um, what we hope to do is uh, to do this sort of thing across patients and controls because we know that and this is part of the RDOC idea we know that patients some patients will perform more poorly than controls others will perform better so it's really not about comparing what's going on in schizophrenia patients and healthy controls but it's really about disentangling subgroups of people who perform better or worse, and who might use different um, circuits uh, than each other during uh, performance of these tasks. So that just takes me to some of, some of the things we hope to achieve by grant end. I just pick three. So one is to detect the neural circuitry underpinning the full range of social cognitive performance and function across our sample. So we do hope to be able to detect what have been called tipping point subsamples. So there may be a few people on one end of the spectrum who are really poor performers who use altogether different neural circuitry. And by dividing up our sample into different levels of social cognitive performance and running PLS on them, we might be able to detect what unique circuits those people use or don't use uh, during these tasks. And that's really relevant for uh, interventions when you're using target engagement based approaches because you want to know what, what circuits different individuals are actually using during the task. Point two, I think it relates to the issue of shared variance or correlations. You know, um, cognition, neurocognition, social cognition, negative symptoms are all correlated in some way. And so we want to be able to disentangle what those unique and shared aspects of variance are in relation to brain circuit structure and function. And sorry, I guess I got to the tipping point subsamples already because uh, I think that's really important for the intervention uh, component, which we hope to uh, do subsequently when this grant finishes because we don't want to be designing interventions for all groups of schizophrenia patients. We want to be uh, tailoring them two subsamples depending on their circuit uh, structure properties or circuit activation properties during these tasks. So thanks very much.
All right, thank you, Aristotle. Um, I just want to hit stop share on your screen. We'll get back to the video for all the participants. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. It was very um, interesting. You had a couple of questions come in. So it sounds like your uh, hypotheses are a mix of sort of uh, more theory driven and sort of exploratory. Would that be correct? Yep. Okay, so you're just kind of hoping to use the analyses to get at these different circuits without necessarily being. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I mean, the analyses themselves have a, you know, PLS, it, the approach is kind of agnostic in a way. So we're not, you know, picking out regions um, like you, you might want to do in, in, in a hypothesis driven based approach, but we, we believe we're going to find certain things based on the literature and the biology and how we understand things. But mm -hmm. the approach we're using will tell us which circuits are related to which social cognitive performance, which social cognitive tasks. Um, and they may be the circuits we, we uh, suspect and they may be other ones, but because we're using a whole brain voxel wise approach, the method will detect uh, what are the relevant circuits uh, during that time. And did you have any particular, you mentioned your site was a multi-site study, right? Did you have any sort of particular issues in designing it to, to allow for mm -hmm. combined data across sites? Right, so that's a whole other talk, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, and we spent, we spent a lot of time and put in a lot of effort uh, preparing for this application, probably a year and a half to two years, including um, people being scanned at each site. Uh, including consulting with people who've done this before, uh, and uh, Jessica Turner is a co-investigator in our grant. Uh, she's a she was the manager of the FBURN, which was, I think, maybe the first multi-site imaging study attempted in in schizophrenia. So Jessica's been very helpful, and um, we basically did as much upfront work as possible in terms of preparing things, running phantoms on the scanners, uh, trying to detect um, site differences, and I think. One thing that was really important for us was to accept the fact that there are going to be intersite differences and not to pretend like we're going to get things identical across each site, particularly from the scanning point of view. And the important thing for us was to be able to understand what those differences were and how to quantify, quantify them and then how to deal with them after the fact. Now, I didn't get into that in this particular presentation, but that was, I think, really important for us to be realistic about that and, and to come up with approaches to, to handle those issues. Okay, and one last quick question before we move on to our next presenter. Um, how do you plan identifying your tipping points, statistically the tipping points you mentioned? Right, so there's a number, I think you know, the, the next two presenters are gonna probably give us some ideas, um, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, one really easy approach that isn't statist statistically sophisticated at all could simply be to, um, uh, to divide your group into quintiles or even, you know, with, with an N of 300, you know, we could probably even divide it up a little further. I mean, you want to have adequate power within each subsample to, to run your analyses. And I think the nice thing about PLS is so long as we're getting good bootstrapping results, suggesting our data are reliable and the findings are not being, you know, uh, not problematic within each subset, then we'd feel confident in those results. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Lisa, do you want to get going on your presentation next? You're muted still. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yes. You can go ahead. Do you see that okay? All right, so today, as Zuma mentioned, I'll be talking about um, defensive reactivity across the anxiety disorder spectrum, taking more of a conceptual descriptive approach as opposed to a statistical one. And I just want to mention that I'm currently at the Medical University of South Carolina, uh, but this data was collected with um, Peter Lyon, Margaret Bradley, and a host of colleagues at the University of Florida. So just to start, as I'm sure you all know, the defensive system is activated in the context of threat. And essentially, neural structures with outputs to structures that mediate uh, reactions in a host of autonomic as well as somatic physiological systems prompt a wide array of, array of responses. And in animal models, the extent or the strength of defensive activation is in large part a function of predator imminence or proximity. So uh, that is to say that stages of pre-encounter with threat, post-encounter, and circus strike or overt action each have um, a characteristic series of coordinated responses. And Peter Lang and colleagues, as well as other individuals, have suggested that our human laboratory-based paradigms are, uh, in fact, akin 
to the post encounter stage. So once threat has been detected, and that given that we should be able to assess this uh, coordinated defensive respond across channels. And in fact, you know, we have shown as well as others across a range of different paradigms that there is in fact coordinated defense cascade across multiple measures in the case of healthy adaptive defensive mobilization. One paradigm which we found particularly productive for prompting a, this multi-system defense cascade is narrative imagery, in which participants listen or read a narrative script, and they've been instructed to actively imagine themselves involved in the subsequent period as a protagonist as opposed to an observer. And in fact, narrative imagery reliably modulates uh, subjective or self-reported arousal and aversion. It increases fear potentiation consistent with perceived threat, increases heart rate, as well as skin conductance, so autonomic measures, as well as sorry, as well as um, corrugator EMG or facial frowning. So across multiple measures, what we see is a coordinated defensive response in the context of adaptive defensive mobilization or adaptive emotional processing. But what about disordered emotional processing? So we've actually used narrative imagery extensively in anxiety patients, and I'll show some data of over 500 participants. And what you'll see is individuals that uh, represent basically each of the principal anxiety spectrum disorders, as well as a sample of demographically matched community controls. But before we jump into the physiological data, what I wanted to show that is if you look at their symptom scores, what actually emerges if we simply uh, order these individuals or these principal groups based on the severity of their scores, what we see is a continuum of increasing negative affectivity with decreasing focal fearfulness. And by that, I mean that on the left side here, we have controls followed by principal specific phobia, social phobia circumscribed to performance situations, so very focal fear disorders, followed by panic without agoraphobia, generalized social phobia, panic with agoraphobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and PTSD at the, at the extreme. Now it's very important to keep in mind that this continuum of increasing negative affectivity with decreasing focal fearfulness of the principal complaint is not limited to depression, the BDI or depression more broadly, but is evident also in nonspecific anxiety, functional interference, as well as um, comorbidity. So to see how uh, physiological patterns line up with this, we'll actually start with PTSD, so a disorder at the extreme of this negative affectivity continuum. And what you see here, this is startle reactivity during imagery for controls and principal PTSD patients. And this is not gonna be surprising to anyone that what we see in PTSD as a group is exaggerated startle reactivity. Uh, here I've, I've um, depicted just the startle data, but we also saw this pattern of exaggerated defensive engagement in heart rate, skin conductance, corrugator, as well as subjective responding. And so essentially we are in fact seeing coordinated, uh, exaggerated defensive responding across measures in PTSD. But what happens when we take out, we start looking at meaningful subtypes. So in this, on here, oops, I'm sorry. Here we have the single trauma PTSD group, and this is multiple trauma. This is startle reactivity to acoustic startle probes, and we saw a very divergent response with really pronounced reactivity in the single trauma group, but actually incredibly obtended reactivity in the multiple trauma. And this was evident in skin conductance, and then more modestly also in heart rate. So a natural question is, well, did we just fail to activate them? Well, when we looked at their subjective arousal ratings, we actually see similarly extreme arousal in both subtypes. So a discordance between their physiological reactivity and their self-report. But to complicate matters more, if we actually look at facial frowning, we also see exaggerated reactivity in both subtypes. So just to summarize, what we're finding here is that in a single trauma group, which shows more limited comorbidity, a more focal fearful response, we actually see coordinated, exaggerated defensive engagement across a whole host of different channels. Whereas in the more comorbid, broadly negative affect, more broadly distressed, multiply traumatized individuals, we actually see prominent collapse of some defensive channels, but, but simultaneous with exaggerated reactivity, and so prominent discordance. Now, I've talked about PTSD so far, and we just selected that as an example, but we also see this pattern within each of the anxiety disorders as well as between them. So here I've just plotted the fear potentiation scores, the startle reactivity during personal threat imagery, simply based on magnitude. And what you see, reminiscent of what we see in their self-reported negative affectivity, 
is that focally fearful disorders tend to be more reactive and as their um, the distress generalizes and be, there's this overall weight of affective pathology uh, increases we actually see an attenuation of their startle reactivity but so much what we saw when we looked at each of the individual measures of PTSD, what also changes along this continuum here is that we see greater discordance between different defensive measures as we move from the more focally fearful out to the more broadly distressed. So this pattern led us to wonder, were we going to see a different pattern if we shed the diagnostic labels and instead started to identify groups as a function of their response system concordance or discordance? What we simply did here was we created a composite variable of startle and heart rate reactivity. Uh, and then what we did was sort all the individuals or rank them on this and created five equal bins or quintiles of responders. So these are our hyperreactive rates reactors out to the hypo reactors. And not surprisingly, because that's the way that variable was defined, startle reflex reactivity shows a consistent decrement across this continuum as well as heart rate. But what was interesting for us and what deviated from our analyses driven by principal disorder was that we also started to see greater concordance in the propensity for physiological hyperreactivity or hyporeactivity in other physiological measures. So here we have skin conductance, corrugator EMG, and orbicularis EMG. So how do these physiologically defined uh, quintiles relate to some of our important clinical variables? And what we see here, this is the, the startle heart rate responder and composited again. And then on the right is subjective aversive arousal. So it does not, uh, differences in subjective aversive arousal does not actually predict the differences that we're seeing in their physiological reactivity. But what does relate is an inverse pattern of increasing broad negative affectivity as physiological reactivity decreases, as well as increases in functional impairment. Uh, now, one thing that's important to note is that this is not a simple one-to-one -one correspondence with principal disorder. So at every one of these quintiles, every single principal anxiety disorder was represented. There was, of course, um, the tendency for the hyperreactors to have a, a greater proportion of focal fear disorders, and at the hyporeactive end, the opposite pattern that they tended to be more anxious misery. So where do we move from here? Well, we have seen over, we spent an extensive amount of time assessing multiple measures in multiple disorders and found that it is, it's very rich, but it's also very complicated. And as a first, you know, this quintile analysis or this composite um, hyperreactors, hyperreactors was really just a first uh, step, exploratory step at an RDOCing approach. And in fact, is really quite crude. And so as we've moved on, what we've done is try out different clustering techniques to try and capture the full dimensional variation among the multiple physiological and self-reported measures as well as symptom measures. And that has not been without hurdles, I have to say, and I'm not going to elaborate on that because Meredith can do a much better job. But it has, from our perspective, suggested that this could be really meaningful moving forward. If you take, for example, a single trauma PTSD okay, that relative to multiple for which the prognosis and treatment is much better across a number of interventions, this might in part be attributable to the fact that exaggerated, so coordinated, albeit exaggerated defensive reactivity across multiple systems might be easier to remediate than trying to re-engage and resynchronize a disrupted defense cascades. I just want to say thank you for your attention and thank you very much to the team of individuals who helped with this data. Thank you, Lisa. That was a fascinating talk, truly. It was very interesting to see that. Um, we had a question coming in just now and they asked, it seems like the decrease in multiple trauma PTSD might be associated with um, dissociation. Is that, did you find that in your data or did you look at that aspect? Uh, actually, so, Given that we are seeing, it's a really important question and we get it a lot. Um, and this is one of those reasons, in, in my opinion, that you, it's really essential to have multiple measures. So while we do see attenuation in startle skin and uh, heart rate, we actually see an exaggeration, even in multiple trauma, in corrugator EMG or subovert facial frowning. And we also see it in their subjective ratings of their uh, aversiveness, their experience of aversiveness and arousal. So from that perspective, uh, we have been interpreting it not as uh, a function of dissociation. Uh, the same person also remarked uh, that it probably varies by developmental phase of exposure to trauma. I'm not I'm sure. Sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, they remarked that it probably varies by um, developmental phase of exposure to trauma. So I don't know if you have any data 
that's that speaks to that. That's absolutely true. So the the multiply traumatized individuals have a totally different developmental trajectory because their trauma exposure, on average, started I believe when they were eleven and ended, uh, and actually proceeded right through the time at which they. Um, created their onset of their PTSD. And so they'd experienced PTSD for three times as long, but they had been experiencing cumulative trauma exposure over the lifespan. So that's a very important point. Okay. Uh, another person asked, uh, can we get more information on the plants on how you will recruit in the future and analyze the data you have to examine these ideas in an RDOT manner? Uh, actually, so that's why I have to say that I have to echo the sentiments I've heard from many people, and we've talked about it also um, with some of the presenters here, that they're, they're we have also been um, struggling to find methods that actually work, and that's one of the reasons I've been really excited actually about Meredith's methods, and we've actually already talked about utilizing hers. Uh, and so we're, we, we want to be doing a lot of clustering methods. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been looking, I have to say, it's really necessitated that we look outside of our typical um, colleagues into like engineering departments, uh, people who've done large scale um, network modeling as well. And so I think it's, it's an open question and we are exploring a whole range of them. So I do apologize, there's no straightforward answer. Um, the other thing that I was very interested to note about your data was that the SALT report didn't always quite jive with physiological reactivity. What implications does that have on general, do you think, on things like diagnosis or, you know, which is all based mostly on self-report for better or worse? Um, I think that I, I certainly wouldn't necessarily say that this calls into question the validity of the of the diagnosis, but I do think it, it um, means that we need to keep in mind what intervention means when we ask them, for example, subjective units of distress during exposure therapy, if it's completely inconsistent with what we're seeing in their physiology, are we actually tapping into the mechanisms that, that we believe are essential for symptom remediation? So I think that, you know, of course, ideally, I am a psychophysiologist. I'd like to see this, um, these methods being used more also in the context of, of intervention. Okay, good. And one last question for Milan. Did you explore any racial or ethnic differences in your data? Uh, so the, the sample is predominantly um, Caucasian, consistent with the demographics in um, Gainesville, Florida. Okay. The, uh, interestingly, SES does in fact co-vary along with um, this defensive diminution and discordance. And so, it, you know, the, the weight of affective psychopathology, but also cumulative life stress uh, and um, overall deprivation in the environment seems also to track with this. Okay. All right. Thank you again for that great talk. It's really an awesome job. All right, Meredith, I think you're up now. Yeah. All right. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for that really fabulous uh, introduction into my talk. Um, so I am a biostatistician by training, and I currently am an assistant professor in a psychiatry department at the University of Pittsburgh. And my research focuses primarily on developing and, apply, uh, and applying statistical methods um, for clustering, and I've been focusing a lot on methods for clustering within the RDOC framework. So just so everyone is on the same page, I just wanted to take a brief minute to talk about what clustering is. So clustering is a method that can be used to reveal subgroups of individuals with similar characteristics. And you can think of these subgroups as being separated by natural boundaries. Uh, for example, if everyone watching this webinar uh, could type into a database the number of minutes it took them to fall asleep last night, and how many minutes they were awake after they first fell asleep. Um, I could take that database and then use clustering methods to try to determine how many subgroups or clusters they, there might be within this sample. So for example, I might find two clusters and maybe one of these clusters or subgroups would um, generally fall asleep very quickly, but then they're awake a lot in the middle of the night and maybe the other cluster uh, takes a long time to fall asleep, but then once they're asleep, they don't wake up at all. So that would be an example of um, using clustering to find subgroups of individuals with similar sleep characteristics. And clustering methods are really relevant for our doc because within a sample, you can use them to determine whether there really is a continuum of signs and symptoms 
or in whether there are actually more discrete subgroups within that sample. And if you're only looking at something like self-report, you might expect that, well, hopefully you might find subgroups that are similar to our existing DSM diagnoses. Um, but the nice thing about our doc, is, our doc is that it does encourage researchers to look at multiple different levels of information. So using clustering, you could try to find new subgroups that are based on all these different types of information. And this could be really informative, especially if you could relate these subgroups to relevant outcomes. This might help you to generate hypotheses about underlying disease mechanisms and maybe treatments that you could develop and then target to individuals matching the characteristics of each subgroup. There are a lot of different clustering methods out there. Um, I have been focusing primarily on mixture modeling. A mixture modeling is a clustering method that's based on a likelihood and because of that, it does come with underlying distributional assumptions. And the most common assumption that people make is that their clusters um, are normally distributed. The nice thing about it being based on this likelihood is that it's easier to compare models. And uh, in my opinion, it's easier to select the number of clusters in your sample, which you wouldn't know ahead of time. Um, in order to demonstrate and develop some of these clustering methods, um, as you might guess based on my first example, I've been uh, working with a lot of sleep data. And in particular, I've been using the AgeWise data set. And the sample I'll be talking about today from AgeWise is 216 older adults with and without insomnia. And on these older adults, we um, identified 70 characteristics that may be relevant. Um, and these characteristics were captured through self-reported sleep diary, actigraphy, which is a behavioral measure of sleep, and also polysomnography, which is a physiological measure of sleep. With these data, we wanted to use clustering to reveal um, potentially interesting subgroups that might be based on all of these different data types, and then look and see how those subgroups might relate to our a priori uh, self-reported insomnia diagnoses. Uh, as Lisa alluded to, um, clustering can be a really frustrating methodology to use. There are a lot of challenges that come along with it. And when you have RDOC data, these challenges are only enhanced. One of the things that I think make uh, RDOC data especially challenging for clustering is that the data are often very highly skewed. So as an investigator, it is really important to think about whether you believe that these variables would still be skewed even in an extremely homogeneous subsample or alternatively whether you think that skewness that you observe is actually a result of multiple uh, normally distributed subsamples. So to give you a little illustration, here we have a scatter plot. It's minutes to fall asleep versus minutes awake after sleep onset. And you can see that these two variables are highly skewed. If we want to assume that this skewness is caused or is results from a series of normally distributed clusters, we might see something like this after we fit our clustering model. So you can see that we um, have three clusters here, the red, the blue, and the green. And um, the skewness in this full sample is explained by having these three normally distributed clusters with successively increasing, um, increasingly large amounts of variability. Um, however, when I see a result like this, um, I think that that's just not a great representation of what's really going on and what these underlying subgroups might really be in this sample. Because at least in my experience, no matter how homogenous the subgroup, these two variables are always highly skewed, which might lead me to believe that in fact the underlying data generation process itself is skewed. In this case, we can use a mixture model that's based on a skew distribution. Here, this is based on the skew normal distribution. And if we allow for a skew distribution in our clustering model, we may actually see that this sample is actually one continuous and skewed sample and that there no, are no actual discrete subgroups within the sample. So in addition to having to deal with the skewed data that you get with RDOC, um, another issue is that 
based on the nature of our duck, which asks us to capture uh, data across multiple different units of analysis, there are just a lot of potential clustering variables that you could use. And it's really not clear ahead of time um, which subsets of those clustering variables are actually going to be useful for clustering. Um, and certainly it's also possible that depending on the specific subset of clustering variables you use, you may reveal different but equally statistically plausible subgroups. So because of this, um, I do think it's important to use something like a variable selection algorithm or a dimension reduction, um, but as I'll be talking about later, um, there are also a lot of challenges with that as well. And finally, um, you can use the fanciest statistical model out there. But one uh, frustrating thing about clustering is that um, just because you get a solution doesn't at all mean that it will be clinically useful and meaningful um, in, to the extent to which it's actually related to something that you care about or that it teaches you something new. So I've been working to develop some solutions for these challenges to clustering. Um, and First and foremost, I have been working to really promote the use of skewed mixture model distributions. Um, these uh, currently exist, you can use them. Um, they're available especially in statistical program R. Um, however, unfortunately, um, I think I may be like the only person who's using them right now in this type of research. They're used in other areas, but I do hope that people can begin to consider these skewed mixture model distributions when they really do think that underlying clusters might be following skewed distributions. The second thing I've been working on is to develop new variable selection algorithms, um, but specifically I want variable selection algorithms that are themselves based on underlying skewed distributions. And within that I developed two algorithms. The first one uh, is used to reveal a set of variables for clustering, um, but in particular, I want variables that are useful for skewed clustering. And this particular algorithm completely ignores the data type. So for my age-wise example, um, you could um, use this algorithm on all 70 variables to pick a subset that's useful for skewed clustering, or you could also apply this algorithm within the self-report variables, within the actigraphy variables within the poly variables to see what different clustering solutions arise and then you could compare across and that could provide you with some really interesting information about the heterogeneity in your sample and how that heterogeneity changes depending on the instrument you're using to collect data. Um, the second algorithm that I've developed, I like to think is a little more clinically intuitive and this algorithm is based on the idea that you could have multiple statistically plausible sets of clustering variables in your, um, in, you know, you, within your array of all variables you're considering. Um, and furthermore, I want to um, have a set of variables that incorporate at least one of all the data types that I'm interested in. So in, in my case with the age-wise data, it would be um, at least one self-report, uh, actigraphy, and polysomnography variable. So this slide shows um, that when I applied the first algorithm that completely ignores data type, it identified three polysomnography variables. And I think this is really important to highlight because anecdotally what I have found is that uh, individuals tend to cluster better within a, uh, a type of uh, data rather than across a type of data. So this algorithm did select just three polysomnography variables, even though it could have selected other data types as well. Using these three variables, I then fit a skewed clustering model, and we see that we um, identified four clusters, essentially based on the uh, amount of delta sleep that they were getting, and these clusters were completely unrelated to the self-reported insomnia uh, diagnosis. This slide shows the variables that were selected when I used the second algorithm that I discussed, the one that actually considers data type and forces one of each data type to be used in the clustering model. Um, and here, there were five variables that were selected, and what I want to highlight here is that three of those five vari variables were sleep latency or minutes to fall asleep, but that was based on both self-report, actigraphy, and polysomnography. So I feel like the fact that 
all three of these together, all three of these sleep, sleep latency variables are being used to um, reveal these the heterogeneity sample and to identify these subgroups. To me, it suggests that there may be something there with this feature of sleep and that this may be something to really focus on in future research when we're trying to further investigate disease mechanisms and, and novel treatments that we could develop. So in terms of future work, um, I am hoping to make the code that I wrote in order to do, do these algorithms. I hope that I can make it available, but we're not quite there yet. And um, what I've done so far is really demonstrate and um, develop these methods, but the next step is to really apply them to a larger data set, um, maybe one that's you know, even more directly relevant to RDoC, um, compare subgroups I identify on various relevant outcomes, and most importantly, um, to validate the findings that I get. Um, clustering is extremely exploratory, so it is really important to be able to have one development sample and then hopefully a validation sample so you can see that those clusters are remaining. Thank you, Meredith. That was a great presentation. You walked us through some really sort of complicated <laughs> concepts in a really nice manner, honestly. So yes, we have a number of questions for you that are lining up here. Uh, some of the related features of data, such as, you know, would using um, log normal distributions or transforming your data in some way yeah. where transforms order help? And also, relatedly, how do you know when to assume a normal distribution versus skewed distribution? Those are excellent, excellent questions. Um, so first, the question of whether or not to transform your data. Um, quite frankly, I think there are probably a, a lot of different opinions and views on this. I can give you my personal opinion. Um, so when you're doing clustering, the idea is that you want to understand the heterogeneity in your sample. When you do something like a log transformation, you are changing the heterogeneity in your sample, right? A log transformation by its nature, it does different things to low, you know, variables, uh, le uh, observations less than one than it does to observations greater than one. So, you know, those types of transformations, they do change the heterogeneity. Um, if there's a reason that you really believe that the transformed data are more meaningful than the original data, and that you think that clusters revealed based on those transformed data would be meaningful, by all means do this, but you do have to be aware that those transformations do change the heterogeneity. Um, and then with the question of, um, uh, you know, how do you know if you should use a normal distribution or a skewed distribution? And I mean, I, I really simplified it and I just talked about skewed distributions, but there are tons of different asymmetric and skewed distributions out there. So the nice thing about mixture modeling is that you can um, compare model fit. So you, with a given set of variables, you could fit a mixture model based on a normal distribution. You could fit it based on a T distribution. You could fit it based on a skew normal, a skew T, a uh, Gaussian, I mean, all sorts of different things. And you could go and you could compare those BICs to see which one um, fits best. Um, and you could also honestly um, look at how many clusters do they each indicate? Are the solutions actually meaningful? What do they tell us? Do any of them tell us new things? Um, if there's actually one you know, important take home message I hope people can get from this, it is that Clustering is really very exploratory. Um, and I think for that reason, it would be better, in my opinion, to just accept that exploratory nature of it, be honest and be upfront about it, that the purpose of, of clustering is to generate hypotheses. You're not trying to solve you know, any problems here. We're just trying to generate hypotheses and to, to use it in that exploratory nature. All right, so one last question, because we already have 1256, we're supposed to end at one. So just comment on this briefly. Um, you know, people ask question, are asking questions about what about using something like a latent class analysis or a factor mixture model, sort of, you know, what are your thoughts on those? Um, so, um, yeah, those are good options too. So I think, Thinking about like a type of latent class analysis, um, I think of that being more about grouping um, variables together versus grouping people 
together. So that may be something to think about there in terms of what, what do you want to do? Okay. All right. Okay, I'm gonna, I hate to cut you off here, but we're at 12.57, so I wanna make sure we uh, end at the right time. So if you wanna go ahead and stop sharing your slides at this point, we'll have all our presenters back on screen. All right, so thank you guys for all some wonderful presentations today. You know, what kind of struck me, you know, sort of the common themes, theme of, themes among your presentations was that, uh, you know, sort of the variety and samples you managed to recruit. You know, one of the questions we get a lot, you know, often about RDoC is, well, that's great. You want to look at heterogeneity using all these disorders, cut across disorders and all that stuff. But practically speaking, recruiting people for studies like that is difficult. I mean, you just take anybody who comes, you know, that kind of thing, like a take all comers approach. And I think Aristotle and Lisa, both of you show that it's, that's not necessarily the case. It's sort of more, it depends on what you're testing, basically, you, you know, your, your hypotheses and sort of the spectrum of disorders. So Lisa, obviously you're concerned more with fear and anxiety. And so you didn't recruit patients with schizophrenia, whereas Aristotle was the converse. Right. So, it, I mean, that, I mean, I'm kind of answering my own question here, but it's good to see that, you, you know, it's, it's not that hard in a way. Do you guys have any thoughts to add to that? Just all of you are muted right now, just FYI. Um. I could add one thing. I mean, one of the things we uh, were doing at each site is um, every six months reviewing a recruitment and reviewing um, the constructs that we're interested in measuring to make sure that we have a good range. And then, you know, we'll, if we need to, we can uh, alter our recruitment strategies uh, as necessary. Um, and the other thing which I didn't mention actually, which maybe is unrelated is just, you know, even within the schizophrenia spectrum, which sounds a little more limited, I mean, there could be pretty significant differences between first episode and chronic patients. So our, our study is focusing on people at the more at the onset of illnesses. And, and I think that's what the NIMH requested us to do. So that's what we're aiming to do as well. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> um, from a clustering standpoint, I do think that, um, you know, the clusters you identify are really only as helpful as your sample is generalizable. So if you, you know, put together a sample, but it's like totally unrepresentative of anything that you might observe out in the population, you can certainly still find clusters there, but you have to, you know, be aware of, of what, you know, the, what is the sample of which you're explaining the heterogeneity. Whereas if you did do that all comers approach, you might be limited in a, some of the things that you're doing in some of the methods that, you know, Lisa and Arisada were talking about, but with the all comers approach, if you did clustering, that might be sort of a more natural indicator of what the real underlying phenotypes were in the in that area. So that's a very good point. So generally for any kind of statistics you use, not just for clustering, any kind of method, you just want to have as much sort of variation as possible because all our statistics rely on variance anyway. <laughs> All right, um, so just a couple more comments before we end for the day. So folks who are logged in, uh, please do check our RDoC website regularly, especially a section called Funding Opportunities, which you probably will be interested in. There is an RO3 that's currently active for secondary data analysis, where you can apply and do studies along the lines of all our presenters today. Uh, so do check our website, and also do check out the, our newly revamped RDoC matrix. It is really cool way better than the old one. So do go to the RDoC matrix. Just go to Google and type in RDoC matrix. It's the first tip you'll see on, the, on Google. So click on that. Feel free to click around. It's got more of a Wikipedia-like structure now. And anyway, that's it for today. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you to all our presenters. We hope you found the webinar very useful. And feel free to contact us with any questions or comments you may have at rdocadmin at mail.nih.gov. Again, that's rdocadmin at mail.nih.gov. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day now. Bye, all. Thank you.